If you would be taking a copy of God's Word and turning with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, we're going to be looking actually at several different passages uh, this morning, but we will be looking at Genesis chapter 11. But as you're turning there, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be back with you. And I was just telling uh, Brother Chip that I think it was just over two years ago that I was with you before. A lot has changed in my life in those two years, but the one thing that has not is the faithfulness of the Lord. And I'm grateful to be with you again today to worship with you. There's no greater joy uh, for me than to worship with the saints of God on the Lord's day. Uh, So I'm grateful to be here with you this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before uh, we get to our text this morning. Lord God, we are grateful that we can be with you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for lifted voices, Lord, for just these ordinary means of grace that you give us, Lord, to... Uh, to empower us, Lord, but to bring glory, ultimately, to your Son's great name. Lord, I pray over the next 40 minutes or so, Lord, that you will open our eyes and hearts and minds to hear from you this morning, Lord. We long to hear from you, that the Spirit of God would meet with us in your word. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have been blessed with the opportunity for the last couple years to really put my focus and my eyes and my mind and my heart on all things uh, foreign missions. As Brother Chip said earlier, I do uh, work with Heart Cry Missionary Society where we have the opportunity to serve uh, men in 300 and uh, 300, about 380 different men in 70 different countries around the world. Primarily pastors, church planters, evangelists, indigenous people who are doing the work of God uh, all around the world. So I get the opportunity to put my eyes and my focus and my mind and my heart during uh, the day and oftentimes, sometimes in the early morning, according to who I'm talking to uh, around the globe, uh, to think about the question, how are we going to reach the nations? How are we going to reach the nations? There's some 8.1 billion people on the planet, 235 sovereign nations, but of those 8.1, 3.5 billion are considered Unreached. That is a large number of people who are considered unreached. So when we ask the question, and we should rightly ask the question, how are we going to reach the nations? It's a legitimate question, one worth praying for and pondering on and and trying to think about how we are to do this, strategizing biblical strategies of how to, to get into these nations and share the gospel. Yet before we seek to ask that question, there are two questions that I want us to ask ourselves this morning and and seek to discover the answer to. Why are there nations? And what's their end point? What are we doing here? What's our point of being here? What are we doing here in history now? Where did they come from and where are they going? And when we understand those things, it can better help us to formulate an understanding of how we are to reach them today. So if we're going to reach them, it would be good to understand their starting point and end point. So in chapter 11 of Genesis, we're going to get to that in a moment for some, for some context. To let us understand what's going on in, in uh, chapter 11. So in chapter 9 of Genesis, we understand Noah and his sons have gotten off the ark and the covenant is made with Noah and the Lord blesses Noah and commands he and his sons with this. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's a key aspect, and fill the earth. So we see it twice in in verse 1 and verse 7 of chapter 9, this strict command the Lord gives us. Then we get to chapter 10. This is what is known as the table of nations. This is where we see the the, uh, Noah's people, Noah's tribes going out, his sons, and filling the earth. And if you look, you'll see Ham. He, he descended, and his descendants uh, went south into Egypt and, and to fill Africa. You see... Shem going east and going into to what we know as the Middle East and, and eventually into Asia. And then you see Japheth and he and his people went north, north, east into what we know now as uh, Europe. This is kind of the, the standard places that we see them going. And if this was it, if we just read chapter 10 and there was no opening part to chapter 11, we would say they were faithful, they were good, they were obedient. They were multiplying and filling the earth. But we do have those nine verses in chapter 11. And we see then that they were not very obedient people. Namely, they were a prideful people. And they refused then to scatter and fill 
the earth. We see their idolatrous self-worship and the Lord then forcing them to scatter against their own will. So this is the starting point. This is what we see here in chapter 11. We see the starting point, the scattering of the nations. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. So in these verses, we will see uh, two scenes here. We will First, we will look at the human action, and then we will see a divine reaction. So human action, a divine reaction. So let me read the first four verses here of Genesis chapter 11. This is God's word, and it reads this way. Now the whole earth had one language... In the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks and stone and bitumen and for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So first we see the human action. The people here that God had called to to go out, they had unity in their language. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Language is a gift from God. From one man came the whole world. And now we see from one of his descendants, Noah, came a commonality. They had a common bond. They had a common blood, a common culture, a common language. Language is a gift from God. It would have been so much easier to communicate with one another if we just had one language. When you were calling on the phone to try to get the operator to speak to someone, you wouldn't hear press two or dos for Spanish. It would just be one language. When you were on the airplane, you would not hear three different languages telling you the same thing in case the plane goes down. This is what you are to do. And on Christmas Eve, when you are trying to put that gift together for your four-year-old son and you're stressed and you're getting sanctified through all those things. You have that big instruction book with all these different languages. It would be so much shorter. We'd save so many trees if we only had the same language. Language is a gift from God. What a blessing it would have been to have the same language, but we see what the Lord is going to do with that. We do not know what a demic language was here. We just know that everyone, the whole earth, was filled with the same language and the same words. So they were united in language. We also say they were united in their direction. And as people migrated from east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. All of Noah's descendants migrated together. We already start to see that problem where he says fill the earth, but they're migrating together. And they settled in a land of Shinar, which is understandable. It was a fertile land. It was uh, watered by the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. But yet this was the place of this idolatrous city that they were going to build. This place of human might apart from the blessing of God. So we read that all these descendants were united in this direction. They were all migrating together. They were all together. You'll notice a phrase in here. One. One. They were all one. They were united together. All united in the defiance of God's command. Third, we see that they were united in vision. And they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They weren't planning on a temporary shelter or a temporary building. No, they they had moved. and They were doing so in obedience and then they stopped. This was a long-term vision that they had here. They were going to use lasting materials. So imagine you're in the jungles of Ecuador and there's a river and there's a need to get from one side of the river to the next. And and no, we don't need to think about the future. We're just going to have a rope bridge to be able to get us from one side to the next. And that was fine. That was a short term temporary fix. But what this idea is that, no, these Ecuadorians, they decide we're not going to build a rope bridge. But for the dignity of humans and for the beauty, we're going to take stones. We're going to make this arch bridge that's going to last for generations and generations and generations. They had a forward thinking about themselves. They want a name for themselves. It wasn't a temporary situation. They had a vision that lasted longer than themselves, though they wanted their name to be made great. Yet this vision would come with grave consequences. 
we also see that they were united in pride and disobedience in verse 4. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So here's the reason the Lord is going to do what they're doing, what he's going to do. Pride and idolatry. It was about my name, our name, our name. They wanted to build a city. A city, building a city was not sinful within itself. If only Nimrod and his clan had just stayed there, and it was only them because he's the one that's attributed to building this city in chapter 10. If only they had stayed there and they built the city for the glory of God and the honor of God, and they would fill that city and the rest would disperse, there would not have been a problem with building the city. This was not the problem. The problem was they did so out of pride arrogance, disobedience, and idolatry. The arrogant people collectively said, come let us build ourselves a city. Let us make a name for ourselves. Was it about the glory of God, the one who had persevered their family and told them to go out? No. They didn't want to be scattered because they did these things lest God do what he said he would do and scatter us abroad over the face of the earth. So we see what their work is. They sought to build a city. They sought to build a tower. We see their motives. Let us make a name for ourselves. So we see this human action. Then we get to verse 5. We see the divine reaction. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language And this. What they have begun to do now, nothing that they propose to do will withhold from them, will be withheld from them. So the Lord inquires, he inquires, he looks to see what is going on before judgment. The Lord has a divine investigation. And what he saw confirmed what he already knew. Pride idolatry, and with such unity and such defiance, there is almost nothing these people can't do. So including the building of this tower. Now when we look at some of the archaeological records of the top of tower that they were building, you can look to see in the Mesopotamian region, which is where this was at, what type of tower they were building. Often they, were, they would build towers uh, with a descending staircase. The idea was that the gods would come down to meet with them. That it would be able to go back up. That was the idea behind towers like this. Well, here we find the irony. While they, as a people, were trying to build a tower to heaven to make a name for themselves, the name above all names descends in judgment to humiliate these prideful Self-worshipping people. So verse 7 tells us what he does. The Lord says, come let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord confuses their unity. The people said, come let us build up into the heavens. And what did God say? No, come let us go down and deal with this. The unity of God of the Godhead overpowers these prideful people. The Lord easily defeats their purpose. He chose to then disunify their language, dividing these languages into the different tribes, languages that were unknown to them previously. So think, think of the scene here for a moment. Here they are, cousins. They're working together. They're building the bricks uh, to build this tower, to build this great city. And they're communicating. They're talking about our names being great one day and the next day. They can't even communicate with one another. They can't even say their cousin's name in an intelligible way that they would understand. How sad and difficult that would have been. Yet it was actually quite a mercy of God. God could have just wiped them off the face of this earth. They already knew it. It had happened before. But this was a mercy from God. Instead, he simply confused their language and these once unified people now themselves in a state of confusion 
and disunity. So the Lord confuses their unity, but he also confuses their direction. Verse 8, so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So what a role reversal. What a role reversal. The people together said, no, we're going to find a plain and we're going to dwell here. And God said, no, you're not. I'm going to scatter you abroad like I told you to do to begin with. This dispersal would result in ultimately the fulfillment that God had told them, Noah to do in chapter 9, verse 1 and verse 7. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Be scattered, go. This event is central and understanding where the nations came from. This is where the nations came from. A once unified people now will be a disunified people. Though that they were always to scatter, they would have had one language. They would have had commonality even in that. So here we find the nations being established. They were being sent out. And of course, we don't have all the time in the world to get into this, but God confused their language and he named the place Babel. Babel. The name Babel just simply means to confuse. But this city, this town where this great tower was being built is the city of Babel, which is the birthplace of the city Babylon, the, the, the empire of Babylon, whose people would later come to destroy the city of Jerusalem, whose name would be a byword among God's people for the rest of eternity. Now, redemptively speaking, when we look at this, that this tower of Babel is where the disunification of the nations occurred. And from there, the nations continue to divide, continue to divide, continue to divide. But the Lord had a plan to bring that disunity back into unity. The Lord's plan was one day to reunite his people through the offspring of a Shemite, through an Israelite from the tribe of Judah the kingly line of Israel's greatest king, David. So when we look at the division of the nations, I would like uh, just for a moment for us to consider some, uh, some things for ourselves. What, what, what can we take away from thinking about the division of the, of the nations? It's not just something that we look at and we see this is a historical fact. Well, one of the things I'd like for us just to consider before we, we move to where the nation's going is I, I think it would be good for us to understand that obedience to God is always the best way. Obedience to God is always the best way. The Lord told his people to disperse and fill the earth. They did a good job of the being fruitful and multiplying, but not the second part of that command. If they had simply been obedient, I don't believe they would have lost their language and way of communicating. The Lord was going to have his way. One way or another. This was his plan. He would have it, see it, be fulfilled. So let's think for a picture of a picture just personally for a moment. Let's say a mother or a father tells their child, go clean your room. And the child joyfully right, jumps up right then and goes and cleans their room. Now we know that's maybe a, a hallmark scene. But what we find here is that if they do so, praise the Lord, you have a clean room and a happy home. Now, what if that child doesn't? What scene do we see there? Well, a faithful parent, a good parent, then disciplines their child. And then the child gets up and go and cleans their room. However, they do so now with a sore backside. Simple obedience would have been a better way. A better choice. Now we can laugh at this, but what about we as Christians when the Lord calls us to be obedient? We need to remember this when the Lord calls us to things that may not make sense. But he says, be faithful. Be obedient. He will have his way when he says, this is what you are to do. The question is then, what cost are you willing to pay before you eventually do what the Lord told you to do? 
costs the people a lot that we read here in Genesis chapter 11. What will it cost us? Noah's descendants chose disobedience. They chose to stay and worship ultimately themselves because they wanted their names to be made great. Which we see the Lord is going to rectify as he regathers the nations. So the question of why are there nations, this is where it's at. This is where we see it. This is where, this is where the nations came from. The next question is, what will ultimately become of the nations? Well, for this, we have to flip to the end of the book. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. The end point. The gathering of the nations. The Lord has always had a plan to reunify the nations. And we get a glimpse of it here in Revelation chapter 7. We're just going to pick up at verse 9 and just read 9 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their face before the throne and worshiping God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count. We see the full number of God's people here in the first part of verse 9. Now, we're not going to draw swords on this, but I believe that this is talking about the saved remnant that he heard in the previous eight verses. I believe he's now seeing them, and I believe it represents then all the people of God throughout the history of the world. John seeing them, and this is no small number. It says there is a great multitude, the full number of God's elect there. Who are these people? Where did they come from? The second part of verse 9 tells us from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. The full number of the nations are here. Notice it says every nation. Every nation. Not just some. Not just the descendants of Shem. Not just some from the descendants of Japheth. There is no curse of Ham here to be found. All nations. Every nation. We find all nations represented. All tribes. All peoples. All tongues. From all the centuries of all of history. Every skin tone. Every language dialect. All of history. Every corner of the globe. Gathered with one unified voice. One holy nation. As Peter puts it, you are a holy nation, Peter says. Here then we find not a dispersed nation, but a unified gathered nation. This is God's promise. This is what God is doing. And we see them raised with a unified voice. Saying salvation belongs to our God. Who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And we see the full purpose of the nations here. They are coming to worship the Lamb. They are coming to worship their King. Remember the people of old had a problem and it was self-worship. Let us make a name for ourselves. And because of it, they became a disunified people. Here we find that rectified. The true people of God now are united in their worship. And it's all for the king. It's all for the king. And the angels joined in the worship band. In verses 11 and 12, they wanted to be a part of what was being said and sung unto the Lord. So this is why the nations are reunited. Because the Lord had promised it that they wanted to worship the king. Jesus says as much in John chapter 4. We read, but the hour is coming and now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. He's seeking worshipers. 
from every tribe and tongue and nation to worship him. The Lord is gathering a people from every tribe and nation to unify them, to make them one. We get a glimpse of this in Acts chapter 2, don't we? We see a little glimpse of this in, in the preaching of Peter at Pentecost and he is preaching in one language and then all the different languages hear a unity there that is being heard the same gospel. The people are being saved and then he sends them back to their homeland and to their hometown for them to tell them, come worship this king. They scattered when the others stayed to go and do and be obedient to what God had called them to do. To go and tell them there's a king and you must worship him. A unified nation, worshiping God forever and ever in glory. This is the glorious end point of the nations, being gathered together and worshiping our King. So as we look around the world today, it may not seem like this is possible. How is God going to gather the nations when there's such disunity, there's such hatred for our king? It just seems like the world is so messed up, this could not be a reality. It seems like when we look at our Christians on Twitter and everything else, there's such disunity between brothers and all the rest. How is God going to do such a thing? Well, he is God and he has promised that he will do such a thing. But we've got to realize we've not made it to the end yet. There's a lot of things that we look around and it looks like it's messed up. But God is doing something. He is painting this picture and he will have the perfect picture. Now, if you go with me for a moment, I want to ask you a question. Do any of you guys remember the, the, the great TV painter and artist Bob Ross? Big Afro. I loved watching him as a kid. I loved watching Bob Ross. I loved growing up watching him, and he would start with this blank canvas, and he'd just have his little paint here, and, and he would take it, and he would start to put paint on the canvas here, and paint on the canvas there, and eventually you started to see that there was a picture that was coming out of what seemed like chaos, with just the paint being put on that white canvas. Well, he would start off, and he would add that paint, and, and eventually you start to see a landscape, or you, you, you'd see these mountains and this stream, and all that was coming together, then... He does the unthinkable. He draws a little black squiggly line down the middle of that painting. And you're thinking, no, 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 you've just messed it all up. Bob, what are you doing? Me telling the painter what he should be doing. And he says, let me just add a happy little tree here. And it's like, you're not making me very happy because you've messed up the whole painting. What are you doing? That's what I'm thinking to myself. After time, that black line seems to come into focus and you start to see, oh, it is a happy little tree. It's a beautiful spot in the middle of his painting. It starts to become more and more and more beautiful. And by the end, you finally see it. All the things that seem so disjointed with such disunity come together to make this masterpiece that he was painting. When we see this, it should give us encouragement that when the Lord has promised that he will bring unity, that he will have a people, that he will have a holy nation, that we trust in the painter, we trust in the one who has made the promise. Friends, understand what sin destroys, the Lord can redeem because he's promised to do so. The Lord can restore you don't have to call up Ben and Aaron Napier from HGTV for your restoration needs. We have one that is the great restorer that will come and restore it with exact precision and perfection as he has said he would. He has promised to restore his people, to gather the nations. And this is what he's doing as we speak. So finally, I want us to look then just shortly here at the gathering of the nations. What are we to do now, in other words? We see the beginning point, we see the end point, but we live right here in the middle. What are we supposed to be doing? From the time of Babel, it didn't take long for the Lord to reveal his plan for the regathering of the nations. Next chapter, Genesis chapter 12, we read about the calling of a pagan stargazer by the name of Abraham. Abram at the time. 
And it's here where the Lord says, I will make you a great nation. Through him, the nations would be blessed through the seed of his offspring, the seed Jesus. That the Lord would reunite the nations and make them a holy nation. Now from Abraham, we see the story unfold. You have Isaac and you have Jacob. And we start to see the Lord focusing in then on a singular nation that he was forming. The nation of God's people. Yet we also know if you read anything, we just read in Hosea, if you understand anything about the Old Testament people, they did not always or even often act very godly or holy. But God's promise was not reneged. It was not taken back. As God's people were more formally recognized, we see the Lord continue to call other nations together. And we see this even in the Old Testament. We see through a, a small picture of, of the window when he tells the prophet Jonah, go to these people in Nineveh, this wicked city, and call upon them to bow their knee to the king, to repent and believe. And we see the whole city, we read, did so. The regathering, the regathering of the nations coming back. Fast forward then to the first century, to the time of Acts. We really start to see it accelerated. We see Peter's and others from Jerusalem all the way to Joppa. Then we start to see Paul unveiling, going on his missionary journeys more and more and more from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the outermost parts of the world. The Lord gathering his people and gathering his people into one holy nation that would come and would worship him. See, when we look at the first missionary journey, we realize that the first century church, they realize that there are people over there on the other side of the mountain, on the other side of the ocean that are not worshiping our king. We must go and tell them they must worship him. So they sent missionaries out, not just staying in their town of Antioch, but sending them to islands and other nations all out of obedience and loyalty to their king, compelling others to love Christ, to come in faith, to come through repentance, that there is a moment, that this is the moment for you to come to worship the king. I believe John Piper says it well. He says, worship is the goal and the fuel of missions. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Missions is our way of saying, the joy of knowing Christ is not private, or tribal, or national, or ethnic privilege. It is for all. And that's why we go. Because we have tasted the joy of worshiping Jesus. And we want all the families of the earth to be included. The early church knew this. This is why they were sending out missionaries to every part of the globe. They did it locally. but They went and sent out internationally as well. They knew that others could not worship him without knowing his name. While the law was written on their heart and there was enough in nature for them to see there was a God, they needed to know his name. So they went. They knew the Lord was gathering a people from every nation. They had read the Old Testament. They understood the words of the prophets. To be a part of this holy united nation. So they went to the nations. And this is what we see played out in Acts throughout the rest of the New Testament. But it didn't stop there. Once the great apostles died, the message and the messenger kept going on. By the 100s, first Christians were reported in Monaco, Algeria, and Sri Lanka. By the 200s, the first Christians were reported in Switzerland and Belgium. By the 400s, we see it making the shores of Scotland and Ireland. We see the pagan people being reached there. By the 700s, the English missionary Boniface was going to the Germanic tribes. We see Iceland starting to be reached. We see the Lord fulfilling his promises more and more through his word and through the power of the spirit and his people gathering nations more and more and more nations. By the 1500s then, we see the gospel reaching the shores of North America. By the 1600s, the Reformation is taking fire and it is spreading all over the world like a firestorm. And people from all over the world are hearing the gospel and getting saved. By the 17 and the 1800s, the gospel has reached as far as the eastern shores in Asia. 
And then you have people like William Carey in India and Abraham, uh, Adoniram Judson in Burma and Robert Morris in China. The great missionary movement is going and it is going and it is going. And the Lord is picking up people here and here and here and making them a part of his nation, his holy nation. By the 1900s, Christianity was truly global. So as we look back over history and we read historic in these heroic stories of John G. Payton and Hudson Taylor, we read these stories and men like this and women like this should be celebrated. But men and women make no mistake. There is only one hero in this story. And he's not a white man from Europe or a black man from Ethiopia. He is the God man who descended from heaven to come and be our king. To die as a substitute for many who would come and call upon his name through faith and repentance. He was the God man, Christ our king. He is undoing what Babel did in disunifying the people. He's redeeming the nations. And yet he's not done. He's not done. So from Babel until today, and until the end, the people of God are to go and to tell and to call on others to worship our King. For his glory and for the sake of his people. This is what we're called to do until history is no more. To make disciples of all nations. To make them by evangelizing. To mark them by baptism. And to mature them through teaching every word that God has given us. So church, be encouraged. Take heart. The gospel will succeed. It will succeed. The nations, as dark as it may seem, will be reached. God's people will be united. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for you, First Baptist Springville? On a very personal level, I would say it this way. I would say don't give up. Don't give up on your, your son your daughter and your co-worker and your neighbor. The gospel still has saving power. The Lord still saving people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, including your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. You may look at them and see that they have a heart of pure stone. It may seem like they have abandoned the faith that you brought them up in. But until the final number of the elect are gathered and the Lord brings them home, there is still hope and time for them to believe by faith and repent. So don't give up. Continue to live the gospel in front of them. Continue to share the gospel with them. Invest in them. Plead with them that they would bow their knee to the Lord. There's still time. On a global level, I would also say don't give up on the nations of the world. Right now, heart cry is a, a fervent prayer and we are seeking to how we can better reach the 1040 window. If you don't know what the 1040 window is, it's the latitudes, 10 degrees latitude, 40 degrees latitude from uh, Western Asia, the top, or Western Africa, or the top part of Africa, all the way over to the Eastern part of Asia. There are 75 countries uh, within that 1040 window that is considered the deepest, deepest and darkest without any gospel light there. Now the Lord has blessed us to be able to help support men in 20 of those countries. But if you do your math, that leaves how much? About 55 countries that have very little to no gospel light in it. It's dark. It's hard. They kill Christians there. But we're believing what the Lord has said. He will have a people from those nations. They will hear my voice and respond in faith. The nations are Christ's inheritance and he will have them all. Have them all. So pray. Pray for the nations. That's what, one thing you can do. Pray. 
We really truly believe prayer accomplishes much. Pray that the Lord will send a great awakening to these nations. Send, pray that the Lord will send laborers who can sustain all the, the difficulties that there is, is there. Pray for those who are already there, sustaining grace, that they can stay and that they can continue to share and that they can continue to plant churches and do the things that are difficult in these places. Pray for them. Secondly, give. Give for the nations. Most will never be in a place to be able to go. The Lord doesn't call us all to go. Most individuals will never go to Africa or go to Asia. And that's fine. The Lord doesn't call all of us to do that. That's fine. But you can give to those who are called to go and be a part of the financial needs of people who are going and laying their life down and giving their life for the sake of the king. We're called to, part, to, to be a part of this at some level. Either pray, give, or finally go to the nations. The Lord has called some to forsake all and to go. Oh, that the Lord would raise up someone from this congregation that would be willing to do the hard thing. To give up Christmases and Easter's with their family mills around the table with their loved ones to go to a people who have never heard the name of Christ and are not worshiping the King. Some have to make that sacrifice to go. That the Lord would raise up some of our children to go. For the sake of the glory of our King. For the sake of the nations. For the sake of our neighbors across the oceans. Church, wouldn't it be a joy to support someone like that. He hasn't called all of us to go. He's called a lot of us to stay here and to live faithfully and to invest in this church, invest in this community, and that is God's plan as well. But so are the nations, and some have to go. So from Babel to today until the end of history, don't give up. Don't give up hope. Continue. Continue, continue to share the gospel. Do what the Lord has called us to do in making disciples, marking disciples, maturing disciples. Teach others to worship the Lord. Call others to worship the Lord. Call others to do the same. And in doing so, let us march behind our captain and his banner that is raised high as he conquers nation after nation after nation for his name's sake and his inheritance, claiming for himself new nations and new tribes, new peoples and new tongues for the glory of his great name. Let's pray.